Welcome to the very first installment of our Linguistic Special Lecture Series, or LSLS, for 2022. I'm Vinci Santiago of the University of the Philippines, or UP, Department of Linguistics. The LSLS features talks by invited experts on various topics under theoretical and applied linguistics and other related academic and social fields of inquiry. This event is being live streamed on the official Facebook page and YouTube channel of the UP Department of Linguistics. For those tuned in, you may type your questions and feedback in the respective comment sections of both platforms, and we will try to address them after the talk. We request that you keep your queries concise, to the point, and respectful. This lecture is also presented in cooperation with the Katig Collective, an initiative that seeks to advance the linguistic rights of Philippine ethno-linguistic groups. They aim to share information about languages that are in critical condition and gather news about the struggles of indigenous peoples. You may know more about the Katig Collective through their official website, www.thekatigcollective.org, and their official Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash katigcollective. I am pleased to welcome today our speaker, Gerald Roach. Gerald is a political anthropologist whose work focuses on colonialism, state violence, and language oppression. He is currently a senior research fellow at La Trobe University and is also one of three co-chairs of the Global Coalition for Language Rights. He co-edited the Routledge Handbook of Language Oppression and has recently published an article on the necropolitics of language oppression in the annual review of anthropology. Gerald, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. It's nice to be here with you. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Um, I just want to begin with an acknowledgement of the country that I'm on. I'm speaking from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation in what is today known as Melbourne, Australia. Um, their lands were never ceded. They retain their sovereignty and language is an inherent part of the struggle that is ongoing on the lands that I'm speaking from. Um, so with, with that as a brief introduction. I'm going to get started with my presentation now, if that's that's all good. Yep. Okay. Okay, so here we go. We're going to be talking about outrage and language oppression. Um, and thanks to the wonderful designers for this fantastic poster, which I really like. So um, s some details about me down the bottom there. Uh, that's my name. That smiling face is to remind me that I'm very happy to be here today. I appreciate this invitation, the chance to speak with everyone. I look forward to the conversation that's going to follow this presentation. I'm going to try and talk for about 45 minutes, and uh, then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions. So I'm currently at La Trobe University. And uh, you can find me on, on Twitter, where I frequently think out loud um, at G. Joseph Roach. Um, so it's going to be a bit of a historical investigation, not into the circumstances that have produced language oppression itself, but uh, into the, the circumstances and events that have produced our reactions to language oppression. That's what I want to think about. And... In order to, to get us thinking about this topic, I want to start out with these two quotes. Um, first one here is uh, from Alice Taff and colleagues in this um, article, this book chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Endangered Languages. And they, they talk about the, the underlying causes of language oppression. And that's, in fact, where I got that term from, a term which I find immensely helpful in my thinking on, on these topics. Um, they refer to language oppression as basically coerced language shift up to the point where a language no longer has speakers. So that's what language oppression means in this talk. And they end with a series of practical recommendations. What can we do about language oppression? Um, and this one uh, catches my eye whenever I return to this article. Be outraged at language oppression. Um, 
And it's interesting that they need to suggest this. If language oppression is, is an injustice, why do we need to be reminded to be outraged about it? That's partly what I want to think about today. The second quote that I want to compare this with is this quote from Tova Skudnam Kangas, and she's talking about the links between genocide and language oppression, which is something I'm also going to focus on today. And uh, in, in Tova's writing, she's explored this relationship between um, genocide and language oppression uh, in different ways, and her approach to it is somewhat different um from mine uh, we can talk about that in the discussion if people are interested to learn about our different approaches but what she's pointing out here is that when we discuss publicly um links between language oppression and genocide in, instead of provoking outrage at those things instead of provoking outrage at language oppression or at genocide one often becomes the target of outrage right where people will um return uh with these statements like that's an exaggeration people are not killed calling it genocide prevents a serious discussion you are watering down the concept of genocide and so on um so instead of generating outrage about an atrocity and injustice, one becomes the target of outrage. And I just want to start with that comparison, thinking about um, why do we need to be reminded to be uh, outraged at language oppression? And why, why do people often become the target of others' outrage if they, if they um, try to talk about language oppression and genocide together. So that's the kind of to set the broad framework of what I'm interested in here. So the general problem of a lack of outrage about language oppression um, and, and the fact that one get, becomes the target of outrage for talking about language oppression and trying to evoke outrage about it to me is made all the more interesting by the fact that we live in i think what most of us have experienced and would recognize um as what uh has been called an age of anger right we live in an age of contentious politics geopolitical tensions uh, seething online debate and uh and and so on and what is what is interesting is that that outrage, that concern, that contention does not extend to the fact that we are living through a historical moment of unprecedented extent and rates and depths of language oppression everywhere around the world, right? And so um, what do I mean by indifferent to this? I don't mean that people don't care about it. They like certainly people do care. I care. People who are here listening to this talk, I assume, also um, care about this topic deeply. But there is no kind of um, what should I say? Publicly shared outrage that has provided uh, infrastructure for broader social movements and so on. So to, just to think about some of the manifestations of that indifference, like, for example, as a researcher working on language oppression, the first thing that I have to do always is A, explain what it is, and B, explain why this is a problem. Um, because the general public awareness of this issue is so is so low, and it is so uh, unmotivating for people to even learn about it. When you have to remind people again, this is a problem. Language loss is is serious. We need to be concerned about that. Um, secondly, thinking in terms of like social mobilization, political mobilization. Uh, you know, we have a variety of political movements for a range of issues, like uh, like climate change, uh, gender equality, LGBTQI movements, and so on. Um, and all of those social movements are represented by mass social mobilization and a variety of different organizations from across the political spectrum that, that address those issues. And this is simply not the case with worldwide language oppression, that we don't have large scale social movements about this. We don't have organizations that situate themselves across the political spectrum to address this kind of problem. Um, so generally, we have indifference to language oppression. Uh, 
that is generalized. We have individual and small collectives, but we don't have a generalized outrage to this. And I want to think about that in terms of um, some ideas from this article about uh, the politics of moods. So here a mood is referring to that sense of like a publicly shared uh, emotional reaction that aligns individuals' um, emotions, perceptions, and reactions to reality, right? And so in this article, um, the author raises this question, how does it happen that a collective deeply interested in, committed to, and capable of political action is formed where before there had been none? And this is kind of the situation that we're in with global language oppression is that we don't we don't have this um, collective uh, dedicated to political action we have local examples of it like the Kartik collective but we have uh, very few global we have basically no significant global movements around this around this issue and so the author talks about the role that mood plays in formulating these kind of um, contexts for political action and what uh, what they argue is that you need a shift in public mood in order to um, galvanize those actions, right? So at some point there is a collective political mood uh, where any form of political action seems impossible, futile, foolish, or obscure. But then at some point something subtle shifts in the public mood, uh, and suddenly political actants uh, action, political resistance suddenly seems obvious, achievable, and vital right? And then these other actions seem reasonable, right? Actions to reclaim a language, actions to collectively organize, to stand in solidarity with each other, to support language reclamation suddenly seems doable. And so I'm interested in like, what, how do we get to that mood shift? So the argument that I'm, that I'm going to be making basically is that um, I think a mood of outrage about a language oppression, a generalized public global mood um, is necessary to supporting uh, language reclamation everywhere. If we're going to turn around this global problem, we need a global mood of outrage. However, what I'm going to be talking about and arguing is that a number of historical events and the way that they are reproduced today through contemporary discourses have suppressed the emergence of that kind of political mood. Um, and one such event is the formalization of the concept of genocide. I want to emphasize it's only one part of a much larger story that needs to be told, um, but I'm going to focus on where I have the data. So the, the concept of genocide, when it was um, devised in the mid-20th century, it was intended to generate legal mechanisms. So it defined a crime, it instituted uh, laws, it created conventions and so on, but it was also intended to create a mood. And we have this phrase that gets repeated uh, in relation to genocide is that it is it shocks the conscience of mankind. And that's that's uh, so genocide has a mood attached to it. And what I want to talk about is how language oppression was separated from the creation of that mood in, during the process of defining genocide. And my argue, what you know, what my hope is that understanding this history and the way that some uh, moods were created while others were suppressed, I think that that might help generate the right sort of political mood for a global revolutionary move, moment in language reclamation. That's the general idea. So genocide is an interesting concept insofar as we can trace its origins to a very specific historical person and moment. Um, it was invented, uh, first used in the 1944 in this public uh, publication, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe by Raphael Lemkin. And um, He's got those little outrage emojis in his eyes because outrage is a is a motivating emotion in his work that comes through and if you and, and, and his biography as well. So what did he mean when he was talking about genocide? The basic uh, idea is that it refers to the destruction of a group. And he saw it as um, a form of coordinated 
actions, right? That's really important, that genocide was a series of coordinated actions aiming at the destruction of the foundations of a group. And these coordinated um, actions involved various things, which sometimes meant physical killing, but didn't, but not necessarily. It explicitly involved for Lemkin the suppression of a language, right? This was a, a core part of his original definition, uh, but it only involved the suppression of a language insofar as it was part of a broader effort to destroy a group, a coordinated effort to destroy a group. So this was the original intent of the concept uh, as it was formulated by the person who um, devised it. Now, when we get to the United Nations definition of genocide that is enshrined in the Genocide Convention, you can see here is a list of the things that genocide includes, right? Killing members of a group, causing bodily or mental harm, uh, inflicting on a group conditions of life intended to bring about its physical destruction, measures to prevent births, forcible transfer of children, right? These are the actions that constitute the coordinated plan of genocide. Nowhere does it mention language, despite Raphael Lemkin's original intention. So what I want to do is trace the history of how language got removed from the Genocide Convention and therefore how language suppression was kind of isolated from that mood of shocking the conscience of mankind. Um, and so the history that I'm going to go through runs from basically late November 1946 um, to early December 1948. 1948 um, is when the Genocide Convention was passed by the United Nations General Assembly. And I'm going to be looking at these different phases uh, through which the convention was redefined and revised. The red star there is to indicate that it was at that stage in the process when language was definitively removed from the Genocide Convention, and that is the kind of um, historical moment at which the mood that I'm referring to is created, the mood where we are no longer outraged by language oppression. So I'm going to go through each of those uh, phases one by one and look at what happened to language during each step of the process. And just to give you some sense of the way that those um, debates progress, so my uh, my analysis is based on a reading of the collated preparatory documents for the Genocide Convention, which have been published and are publicly available. Now, um, it amounts to about 2,000 pages of, uh, of documents, drafts and meeting minutes and summaries and um, letters and so on. Uh, the different phases took up different amounts of time and produced different amounts of documents. So on the left-hand side, the green graph there shows the number of documents that were produced, right? So in the first phase, it's relatively limited, it's 200 pages. The number of documents produced at each step in the process up until that fourth phase increases so that we have the, the most uh, like the most extensive discussion and documentation produced in that sixth committee phase when the um, when language is removed from genocide. And then what we see on the other side is a kind of inverse relationship in terms of the number of days that are spent uh, debating and discussing those things. So the sixth committee um, discussions where language was removed, where marked by a star, was only 58 days, but it produced 768 uh, pages of documents. And the other phases, despite being shorter, took longer. And so what I'm getting at is you have this um, intersection of like intense discussion and documentation and limited time, which means that it was just a very intense period of um, productive discussion when language was removed. So keep that in mind as we go through. So now I'm going to go through each of those phases um, one by one and trace the way that language was discussed uh, and how how it was debated, at what point it was removed and so on. And then following this step-by-step -step discussion, I'm going to look at some of the arguments that were made um, 
for why it should be removed. So anyway, this first phase um, from November 1946 to May 1947, Um, it passed this resolution, UN Resolution 96-1, passed on 11th of December. And uh, this resolution basically defined genocide as the denial of the right of existence of entire human groups. And what human groups were they referring to? It included racial, religious, political, and other groups. So other groups could potentially include uh, language-based groups. And this is an issue that comes up later in the debates. Um, and this is where we find this phrase of shocking the conscience of mankind coming into the debate. So right from the beginning, when the United Nations um, affirmed that genocide was a crime and set about building a convention that would effectively outlaw genocide, they also deliberately, publicly, transparently set about um, creating a mood in relation to genocide, right? A mood of outrage, a mood of shock. So that it's at, from the beginning, it's a dual process of legal codification but also mood generation. Um, and basically, this, this uh, resolution passed on the 11th of December uh, established a formal request to undertake research within the United Nations for the drafting of a convention. And you have to remember that this is the beginning of the United Nations. It's just being set up. It's trying to define its role in the world. And one of the things that it's going to do is... Um, uh, explore the concept of genocide. And in fact, genocide was passed as the first major international convention of the United Nations just prior to the um, Bill of Human Rights. So it's very significant in the history of the United Nations in that regard. Um, but the important point to remember here is that genocide is defined vaguely. It refers to destruction of groups, but and language is not specifically mentioned, but there is a little door open for it um, in that in terms of other groups and the link here down the bottom refers you to the original document so i can circulate these to anyone who's interested okay the next stage was the preparation of what's known as the secretariat draft of um, the genocide convention where basically the un secretariat uh, commissioned three people three legal experts to draft a convention one of those people was Raphael Lemkin. So the the original proposal, um, the draft res the resolution 96-1, was um, pro prompted by Lemkin, who advocated and, and hustled relentlessly in the UN to get this um, to get this resolution passed. Uh, he then got him ingratiated himself into the drafting process along with two other legal experts. And there's two things to note about the draft that they create at this stage. So one is that linguistic groups are explicitly protected. So we saw in the previous version, groups included racial, religious, political, and, and other groups. And it now explicitly says that linguistic groups should be protected from genocide. They can be targets of genocide. They can be destroyed through a coordinated course of action. Um, and this... Um, draft also includes language in terms of the techniques the techniques of genocide and this is uh, a dual life that we see for language in the genocide convention in the following um, procedures is that language refers to groups and also to techniques so methods of destroying groups so lemkin included um, language in two ways so Pro prohibition of the use of national language, even in private relations, was one technique of, of genocide. And so was the systematic destruction of books printed in the national language or the prohibition of publication of new books. So we see language being um, included in techniques of genocide as something that can be banned, as something that can be uh, destroyed, as something that can be prohibited. Uh, so long And so long as those things are part of a coordinated plan of destruction then it's part then language oppression becomes part of genocide um there is debate at this point amongst the three lawyers we don't have 
like transcripts of their debates, but we have summaries of their debates. Uh, and basically, the debates focus on this idea of cultural genocide uh, and language is included in cultural genocide. So uh, Lemkin supports the inclusion of cultural genocide as a technique of um, genocide, whereas the other two lawyers, they are opposed to its inclusion. But nonetheless, despite these debates, the language gets into the draft and cultural genocide gets into the draft. Uh, basically, what happens next is that they then invite different representatives of countries to comment on the draft uh, as a way of proposing steps forward. Uh, and during that process, um, the United States recommends that they basically scrap that draft and start again, which is what they do. So they, in, instead of discussing and um, enshrining that draft as a convention, they just scrap it and begin again with an ad hoc committee. Uh, the ad hoc committee consists of, I think, about a dozen different countries. And, and it sits basically over the course of the month of April in 1948. So this, this draft, um, the ad hoc draft, they, they work in part of the secretariat draft. They discuss various aspects of it. They get halfway through this process to April 16. And then basically the Chinese delegation turns up with their own draft and they just decide to accept it and this is the draft that they work off to create the ad hoc draft which is essentially the foundation of the contemporary genocide convention um, but we don't really know the story of how it was created but what's important here is that the chinese delegation in their draft and throughout the debates uh, is supportive of the inclusion of language within the broader concept of genocide so we still at this point have the possibility for the creation of that mood of outrage and shock in regards to language oppression. But the, the broader concept of cultural genocide, um, of which language oppression is a part, is highly contentious in this ad hoc um, committee. It is debated repeatedly. There is um, intense work to define what cultural genocide is and isn't. It is um, separated out into a separate clause during this point. So previously, the techniques of genocide are just generically listed. And at this point, they are the techniques are divided into separate clauses for biological genocide, physical genocide, physical genocide, so killing biological genocide, preventing births, and cultural genocide is, uh, is uh, separated into a distinct article, Article 3. During this debate, there's not really um, any discussion of the inclusion of linguistic groups, which was part of the Secretariat draft, so the inclusion of protected groups of linguistic uh, linguistic groups amongst the protected groups, but linguistic groups is just cut out. So they just, in the in the new ad hoc draft that was submitted by the Chinese delegation, linguistic groups are no longer protected, and we'll see why later on. But um, so now language is only present within the draft as a technique of genocide, and it is um, buried within the cultural genocide, which is separated into a separate article of the of the um, convention. There is an entire session discussing cultural genocide on August 26th, where a lot of, um, it's very informative regarding the place of language. Um, basically, the debate confirms that language oppression is an integral part of cultural genocide. Uh, and it includes two references, and we see that these are basically the same as the ones that Lemkin included in the Secretariat draft. So uh, one technique of cultural genocide is prohibiting the use of the language of the group in daily intercourse or in schools or the printing and circulation of publications in the language of the group. So we can see that that combines the two um, techniques that uh, Lemkin had talked about. But it also in includes this um, idea of destroying 
or preventing the use of libraries, schools, historical monuments, and so on. So it's looking at the use of language and the infrastructure that enshrines and reproduces and valorizes language as well. So the ad hoc draft gets through to the end of the um, discussion process and language is there nestled within the concept of cultural genocide. It has been the source of debate, but it has made it through the drafting process. And we then get to the sixth committee. So bear in mind that the sixth committee is the point at which language gets kicked out of the of the convention. The sixth committee of the United Nations is the committee that's responsible for addressing legal questions. So these are essentially legal experts um, discussing how to convert the ad hoc draft into law. Uh, and so they sit during this period, 30th of September to the 2nd of December. And there is very little discussion of language in this um, section, despite the fact that this is the point at which language is once and for all removed from the genocide convention this removal of language is done with very little discussion of anything related to language so most um so though this is the most significant step in the process most of the discussion around language came in the previous um part and essentially what happens at this point uh is that the debate around cultural genocide and therefore language shifts from a definitional debate about what, what cultural genocide is, how to characterize the language oppression that is one element of um, cultural genocide. It, it shifts to this idea of delegitimizing cultural genocide. It shifts to simply saying that this article, this concept does not belong within um, the broader view of, of genocide whatsoever. So an interesting part of this discussion is that you have this really circular um, debate here, which is that genocide has already been defined by Raphael Lemkin. They are given the task of enshrining it in law within the United Nations. However, when, when they come to doing that, they exclude certain parts of the genocide of, of the concept of genocide on the basis that they are not part of genocide. So if you hopefully you see what I mean by a circular discussion, they're asked to define genocide and they they exclude certain aspects of genocide on the basis that they don't fit the definition of genocide. So so at this point the the concept of cultural genocide, including language oppression, is embedded in Article Three of the draft. And they have a, a a special session on this on October 25th. It's not even an entire session. Uh, it's like three quarters of a session, which goes for most of a day. So just to give you a sense of um, how little time that is, it's not just that it's less than one day. Um, if Bear in mind that they started on the 30th of September. They continued up until the 25th of October. So that by this point, they've been going for almost a month and they have only discussed Article 1 and 2 and the preamble up to this point. And so things like Article 1 and 2, they discuss for multiple sessions, not just days at a time, but weeks at a time. And then when it comes to the entire concept of cultural genocide, as it is embedded in Article 3, they just knock it out of the draft in in sort of an afternoon, basically. And what what's even um, more interesting is that when they vote on it, when they vote to delete it, um, thirteen members of the committee are absent on that day. So you can see there it it, it wins twenty five votes to sixteen with four abstentions, if those 13 other people had been present on the day uh, and they all voted for the inclusion of Article 3, um, it would have been retained and we would be living in a moment defined by a very different political mood where language oppression is attached to that sense of outrage and the the sense of shock of conscious, of, of humanity's conscience, etc. Right, but instead, because like 13 people were absent that day, they pushed through the debate in a single afternoon, it got cut out. 
and so that's that's the event that has led to the current historical mood that we live within um it's not quite killed off yet 9th of december 1948 the general assembly meets to vote on whether they're going to adopt this or not um prior to this meeting the ussr who is a strong proponent of the inclusion of cultural genocide throughout the debates um they introduce a proposed amendment to reinstate the cultural genocide clause right so they're trying to sort of we're at a, a turning point the mood the mood could shift here um however during the the meeting to vote on this venezuela usa india and the all and the uk they all spoke against this amendment they all rejected that amendment um and so they they voted that down so it was rejected by a vote of 31 to 14 with 10 abstentions which you can see is a significant number given the balance again but anyway what what matters is that the ussr tried to have that clause included but was not successful it was voted down cultural genocide was gone language oppression was no longer connected to to genocide uh it was therefore also historically divorced from that mood of outrage and shock why what were the arguments for doing that so we can look at um this story in two parts according to what i mentioned before with the language being embedded both in the groups that could be protected or targeted for genocide and therefore should be protected and also in the techniques of genocide so in terms of protected groups the usa the delegation of the usa advocated to remove linguistic groups during the discussions of the secretariat draft so they and they were basically responsible for for getting that for getting that done no one else proposed it it was just the united states and what was their reasoning so they said the inclusion of linguistic groups is believed to be unnecessary since it is not believed that genocide would be practiced upon them because of their linguistic as distinguished from their racial national or religious characteristics and so what they're basically arguing is that no one would ever target a linguistic group purely because of their linguistic difference um and just historically that's an absurd statement to make and hopefully your own understanding and experiences of, of language oppression would would reflect that Tar groups are explicitly and frequently targeted on the basis of language both for discrimination and destruction um and so it was on that on that basis that it just didn't make it into the ad hoc draft ever we don't know exactly how but it's um pretty clear that it's on the basis of behind the scenes um advocacy by the united states delegation okay so i'm probably going to finish up in the next couple of minutes so I'll maybe get up to 40 minutes which will leave us with more time so um then this idea of the language oppression as a technique of genocide um, this was rejected by multiple states on multiple occasions on the basis that they wanted to retain what they perceived as states right to assimilate linguistic minorities um, so it was in order to protect the state's capacity to carry out language oppression essentially so a couple of examples of that um, france was one of the most persistent opponents of including cultural genocide specifically in relation to language so you can see here i won't read through the entire quote but just at the end there the statement is very transparent about what they want to protect the committee should avoid stating the problem of genocide in such a way as to incriminate states exercising their powers in a normal way right so essentially what the french uh, delegation is saying is that language oppression is part of the state's normal exercise of power 
And time and time again, throughout the debates, other states agree with this position. So the USA at one point expressed their concerns about the legitimate efforts made to assimilate minorities. They wanted to protect the state's capacity to legitimately um, assimilate minorities. Egypt also um, expressed this position. They were worried that including cultural genocide in the convention would hamper a reasonable policy of assimilation which no state aimed at national unity could be expected to renounce. So again, protecting states' right to assimilate minorities and carry out language oppression, essentially. And this was also the position that was put forward by the Philippines delegation, uh, who said that the concept of cultural genocide could be interpreted as depriving nations of the right to integrate the different elements of which they were composed into a homogenous whole as, for instance, in the case of language. So the reason why language oppression was booted out of the concept of genocide um, was because genocide was a crime and um, states wanted to keep oppressing linguistic minorities and they, they didn't want to be held responsible or they didn't want to be legally punished for that. Okay, so... The sort of the broad concluding argument that I'm trying to make, bringing that little history of the Genocide Convention together with the ideas of mood and, and so on that I was talking about at the beginning. Um, so I started off by saying that people who are outraged by language oppression, right, who experience that as a person, as an individual emotion, they often become the target of a, of a broader political mood, right, of a broader mood of outrage which says that that outrage that your individual outrage is unacceptable it's inappropriate right so that means that the prevailing mood that we inhabit today the prevailing political mood that our individual actions are interpreted within is that language oppression does not shock the conscience of humanity um i think that this mood was historically produced at least in part in part through the formalization of the concept of genocide and the way that language was removed from it in that in that process so the genocide convention established a precedent for global political moods of outrage and shock right it was a historically important event that did that for the first time um language should have been included in that but it wasn't why wasn't it included in that that moment of like birth of a world historical mood because states didn't want it to right states were given the task of creating that mood by defining the concept of genocide and states wanted to continue carrying out uh assimilation of linguistic minorities so they could not have that assimilation attached to that mood that they were trying to create so they separated it out and that means now that we live in a world historical mood that is one of acceptance and normalization of linguistic oppression, right? And that was a mood that was deliberately created by states. And that mood is reproduced today. It's not as something that exists isolated in the past in history, uh, in 1948 in the chambers of the united nations it's a mood which has to be constantly reproduced in order to exist right and that mood of acceptance and normalization is reproduced whenever people are outraged at activists and active uh, advocates and scholars and so on when they're outraged at them instead of language oppression itself Right. And what I'm suggesting is that mood, that misdirected outrage is a deliberate, historically produced, politically motivated mood um, that is designed to enable language oppression. So I want to end with this quote um, to go back to it uh, and to encourage you to be outraged at language oppression and, and its effect and to understand that uh, the way that your outrage is not shared by other people, the way that you will be targeted by outrage uh, in the broad, broader public is, is, uh, was a deliberate choice that was made by other people at a certain point in the past, but is also made every time um, anyone reacts to a language oppression 
with a mood of normalization and acceptance rather than outrage so the least that the you know the most the best thing that we can do is refuse to take part in that political mood of acceptance or that political mood of normalization and to continue to be outraged and to not accept language oppression okay so i'll end there thank you so much gerald for that uh very comprehensive historicization of all these un documents and debates surrounding the the issue of language oppression and off the top of my head i'm actually thinking about how how the philippine experienced which was um still fresh by around 1947 1948 their experience of colonialism under the united states would have influenced the decision of the philippine delegation to um to make that pronouncement regarding uh, the definition of genocide and uh, language oppression i don't know what you have to say or uh, your thoughts on that yeah we um we unfortunately don't have good um like there's clearly behind the scenes formations of um voting blocks going on in the debate it's really clear so this is the the cold war is just taking off and there's a clear cold war divide amongst the states in the way that they vote and the way that they express their opinions um so they're like i think obviously the alignment between the usa and the philippines at this point around that issue is due to that but i think like the the broader more interesting thing is that on some level they're divided between the two camps on the basis of the cold war but on the other hand, they're all voting the same way because they're all voting to protect states' rights to assimilate minorities. So on, on sort of minor issues of definitionalism around the framing of the Genocide Convention, USA and USSR um, are sort of at each other's throats the entire time, just opposing whatever the other person says. Uh, but on the other hand, when it comes down to it, they all stand together as a united bloc to vote against any non-state peoples who are not represented in there. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's take one of the questions from uh, Anna Ballou. Is there any record of the circumstances surrounding those 13 absences? Is that a pretty mm -hmm. typical day at the UN, circa 1948? Um. It appears to have been unusual. We don't know why those people were absent on the day, but when during the like the meetings of the minute, someone suggests at some point, like, hang on, all these people are not here. Shouldn't we wait until they're here and and have the vote later on? Um, and so what they do is they take a vote on that, right? <laughs> and so you can the people who are not there don't get to vote on whether they should participate in the vote or not. So it's kind of a self-defeating process, but they do it anyway. Um, and it seems to be unusual. I don't have any way to quantify that. I don't think that we have a record of absences going through the meetings, but the fact that someone brings it up in the course of the meeting and says, we, we, we should maybe hold off on this vote seems to suggest that it was unusual and the way that it was rushed through in the course of an afternoon, it does suggest to me that there was something tactical about exploiting those absences. Okay. Now we have a question from Rohan Taduran. Is there any movement to finally include linguistic groups uh, in the definition of genocide? No. Um, so there isn't. So that like the, yeah, I think, so in terms of the, the genocide convention itself is basically set. There is an ongoing evolution of the way that it is interpreted. Um, and so there are constant, so the text is set, but it's legal interpretation is constantly expanding there does not seem to be any effort to reinterpret the place of language within the convention um, and that's because that the whole article of cultural genocide was definitively removed and that has just profoundly shaped people's perceptions of the appropriateness of of reintegrating it right so it goes back to what tova talks about at the beginning of the lecture where she says if to even bring these things up is just seen as so inappropriate so irresponsible so outrageous etc 
um, that it's very hard to get a conversation off the ground about these about these matters um, in in formal context. Even within academia, it's very difficult. Let alone within the legal context of the United Nations. So that you know, there are all sorts of interesting things happening around language and um, so on within the United Nations, such as the International Decade of Indigenous Languages. Um, but in terms of recognizing the fundamental place that language oppression plays within genocide, as far as I know, there is no discussion of that ever happening. I see. Okay. We now have a question from Elmer Brabante. Is the language of leaders that do not respond to the needs of people, but rather contribute to the aggravation of their decrepit conditions considered oppressive? Hmm. So let me say, yeah. So that idea of language oppression that I'm using, it specifically, it doesn't mean oppression through language. It refers to um, the creation of unfree choices in relation to language, uh, if that if that helps at all. So, um, so that like that idea of language oppression, as I'm using it, wouldn't provide us with any kind of answer to this question. But uh, from my own perspective, is the language of leaders that does not respond to the needs of people, but rather contributes to the aggravation of their conditions considered oppressive? Um, I would say that, yes, you can consider that oppressive, right, insofar as it denies choice, it denies agency, it creates a hierarchical relationship of domination. I would say in those ways, like just the fact that you have a leader speaking on behalf of people who cannot voice their own concerns, that in itself is oppression um, before they before you even need to consider what that person is saying that is oppressive in itself, I would argue. Okay. We have a rather lengthy comment from Sir Tuting. Okay. The diversity of languages has always been a problem with colonizers coming from monolingual societies. They see diversity as something that must be leveled in what is often referred to as assimilation, as repeatedly uh, seen in the documents and debate transcripts. Therefore, I am not surprised that elements or formations created, populated, and controlled by former colonizers, aspiring colonizers, and neo-colonialists would diminish and devalue the importance of linguistic diversity and remove language oppression and cultural genocide in the overall definition of genocide. There seems to be a chicken and egg question here. The fact that states thought that language and not others was fair game suggests that language oppression wasn't seen as outrageous to begin with. I think this is in response to, ah, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. What can you say about that, Gerald? Yeah. Um, yeah, so there, there's, there's a number of really interesting um, quotes that come up around this topic of language oppression already not being seen as sufficiently outrageous. Um, so I'm just trying to think if I can remember them or if I have the quotes written up on my wall somewhere above my computer here. Um, no, I don't have the quotes with me. But um, there, there's there's quotes to the effect of, like, to murder and to prevent people from using a library are not the same thing. They cannot be included on the same in the same... Um, uh, they cannot be attached to the same mood, right? That's not a quote, but... Um, or to be, to be uh, like, murder and preventing someone from using their mother tongue are uh, not equivalent, uh, this kind of thing. So there's, there was already this sense that um, language oppression was insufficiently outrageous to be included. But it misses the point of, um, like, no one was saying, and it's never suggested, and there's actually no reason to think that every aspect of genocide has to be outrageous in equal measure. What matters is that they have to take place in terms of a coordinated plan of destruction right so there but yeah there was there was there is this chicken and egg problem 
that people were already conditioned to not be outraged by language oppression. So they were already belittling it in the process of making it, right? And they were belittling it and they were already not outraged because they were already sort of carriers of that state-centric language ideology that one people, one state, one language, this is efficient, this is good, this, uh, this makes up for anything that might be negative about language oppression. And so I just want to come back to something that Tooting said at the at the start about language diversity being a problem for colonizers and then talking about colonizers coming from monolingual backgrounds um, and that we shouldn't that we should therefore not be surprised by them promoting these ideologies. And I suppose I just like I think it's important to push back a little bit against this idea that um, that those ideologies were produced by their by their backgrounds or the conditions of where they came from, um, et cetera. That kind of like naturalizes those ideologies of, of monolingualism. Um, and, and in fact, those ideologies were, were like deliberately chosen and cultivated for political ends, right? It wasn't a reflection of, of monolingualism existing anywhere because it doesn't, right? Um, they those colonizers had deliberately crushed linguistic diversity at home um, and then they set out to crush it in other places because it they'd been able to do it they got away with it and they continued to act with impunity right and it was an ideologically motivated um decision uh and it, and it was not just contagious across time and space within the practices of a single colonial unit like you know the british colonizing america then australia then new zealand but it was also contagious across space and time in terms of other countries so other countries saw them doing it and they're like aha we can get away with that too and and you know that kind of that kind of um con the contagion of impunity that's what the united nations set up to defend right we give every state the impunity to assimilate whoever you want in order to protect your territorial integrity and national sovereignty and so on right so the like in that sense the united nations becomes a mechanism it's like the ultimate expression of that historical process of um contagious impunity and um i would also like to mention that on October 4, you have you actually have a policy brief coming out. Yep. This is on the Latrobe Asia Brief, Indigenous Language Rights and the Politics of Fear in Asia. You authored this along with Madoka Hamine. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and with Tuting as well. Uh, so yes, Professor and Hernandez sir. and I and uh, Madoka authored this policy brief. And we're looking, um, so just briefly, it's about the International Decade of Indigenous Languages, which is being promoted by the United Nations. And we're looking at how, um, so the approach of the of the decade is, is based on the human rights approach. And then secondly, on the participation of Indigenous people in in promoting and supporting indigenous languages. Now, both of those things are, are good things, right? Human taking a human rights approach to language is is good. It's positive. Um, encouraging indigenous people to participate in promoting and supporting their own languages. That's also good. That's positive and something I would encourage everyone to support. The broader issue that we look at is that um, around the world today. Uh, the situation for human rights defenders and their particularly indigenous human rights defenders is declining everywhere. Uh, and so the report looks at specifically China, India, and Indonesia, looks at the declining um, prospects, the increasing violence against human rights defenders in all of those countries, uh, and basically looks at the, basically we argue that the United Nations decade of indigenous languages is encouraging um, human rights defenders, indigenous human rights defenders to expose themselves to political violence, right? And so we're talking about how do we respond to that situation? What can we do to uh, act in solidarity with those human rights defenders to help them support indigenous languages, to minimize the harm that they're likely to face from the states that they 
happen to live in at the moment and so on. Okay, we now have a question from YouTube from Joshua Patrick Vidal. And there were already some countries mentioned earlier, but uh, what states were in favor of including linguistic uh, genocide? Hmm. Um, so the states that promoted um, the inclusion of cultural genocide more broadly uh, were generally on the USSR side of the Cold War block. So the USSR um, promoted it, the, um, the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic also promoted it. Uh, China was a strong advocate. So remember, this is 1948. The communists haven't come to power. It's still nationalist China. Uh, China was a strong proponent of including cultural genocide. And at some point during the discussion, they say that um, the destruction of a group's language may be even more um, serious than physical genocide because it destroys the group while leaving the physical bodies intact. Um, and so they were the they were the main countries who supported it. There were a couple of countries that took a, a halfway stance where they supported cultural genocide, but wanted to remove language from consideration. So Egypt was one example, and Pakistan was another example, where they were essentially concerned about preventing forced religious conversion. So they were worried, for example, Pakistan was worried about Muslims in, in India. They were worried about the fate that they face. They were worried about about forcible conversion of Muslims. Um, and so they wanted a concept of cultural genocide, which would pr protect people on religious grounds, but would enable states to assimilate them linguistically. Okay. Let's have this question from Facebook from Vittorio Morales. Would you consider inaction to promote a uh, quote unquote inaction to promote the integrity of linguistic groups, language oppression? For example, no laws existing to promote uh, to protect rather linguistic groups, or does there have to be an intent or purpose to oppress for it to be called language oppression? Mm. Yeah, so I would I would say that intent is not. We don't need to consider intent necessarily. In this, um, what we need to do is look at the the impacts that, that that it has on the group being affected, rather than the intent. So most language oppression is carried out through uh, inaction and indifference, rather than deliberate, violent, uh, explicit oppression. Um, so the the person who I find very helpful to read on this topic is a philosopher, an ethical philosopher called Claudia Card, and she has written a number of books um, on this idea she calls the atrocity paradigm. Um, I think one of the books is just called the atrocity paradigm. Um, and she talks about this idea of rather than like, um, uh, like actively producing it. She talks about complicity in, in the social reproduction of oppression, right? And that's, I think, a useful way to think about it because most, like it's one of the reasons why I think the term language oppression is good because we, we are accustomed to thinking about oppression in terms of social structures and systems and relations, you know, uh, racist oppression, gender oppression, et cetera. Um, and those kind of models are useful for thinking about language and and how language um, how languages are forced into dormancy, how populations are coerced into taking up majority languages and not transmitting their heritage language. Right? Um, there's this general misconception of language oppression taking place through explicit violence, through the destruction of books and libraries, through um, violence against people through legal bans, etc. But mostly it's done through much more subtle and diffuse mechanisms, which are primarily related to, um, yeah, indifference or failure rather than active suppression. So let's have this question from YouTube from Nix Albaida. Most of the victims of language oppressions are members of linguistic minorities. Would the amendments in the United Nations have helped them when it only protects national languages? 
or explicitly protects national languages? How could we fix this gap? Yeah. Yeah, so that's an excellent question. This is one point that I came back to in my reading and rereading of these documents is that even when they were discussing languages in the Genocide Convention, it often came back to this idea of national languages. And it's not clear what different countries mean when they talk about national languages. So, for example, the delegate of Poland um, frequently talks about the importance of protecting national languages, and it's pretty clear that they mean Polish when they say that. Um, so it's from that perspective, it's possible that uh, only states' languages would have been protected by this anyway. And what they were considering was, under conditions of foreign occupation, do we have a legal right to protect the national language? That was what they were considering. Um, but then you have the USSR delegate talking repeatedly about the need to protect national languages. And the concept of a nation was um, promoted very differently in the USSR, right? Uh, so a nice formulation of how it worked is this idea of um, the the USSR was an empire of nations. So the state nominated different nations that existed within the Soviet Union, and those included the, the so-called titular nations, like the Kazakhs, Tajiks, etc., who had their own republics, but then also other minority groups who were recognized as um as having obtained the status of nations uh and there was a, there was a huge disparity between languages and nations right and this was deliberately engineered so that you could assimilate away a bunch of languages but you would retain nations with their languages and so when the when the soviets are talking about this it, again it's not clear but it seems to be that they are talking about national languages in terms of the recognized minority nationalities of the country. And so they are aiming also to protect them, but that's also a, an assimilatory mechanism which wouldn't have promoted the protection of all languages of, of Russia as well. So that's that's two things where it's like different levels of protection for national languages. But the, th the third thing that's really interesting is that um, there's kind of this implicit secret inclusion of language in the protected groups in the current version of the genocide convention through the inclusion of what's called ethnical groups so the protected groups include racial religious uh national and ethnical groups and the ethnical groups concept was introduced by the swedish delegation during the sixth committee debates um and the inclusion of it's very weird in the documents because everything like the debate is going is proceeding like a rehearsed conversation that all the debate has actually taken place behind the scenes and then the Swedish delegation and everyone has kind of agreed to get rid of language and then the Swedish delegation wanders into the middle of this and says like I think we should protect ethnical groups and everyone is like what is an ethnical group this isn't a thing and he says well I think an ethnical group is when a minority group within a country has a distinct language and we need to we need to protect them on the basis of their um of their language even if they it's not a national language and it doesn't exist anywhere else right and i don't remember if he mentions this specifically but he would have been thinking about like yiddish speakers in sweden or finnish speaking swedes or the sami people etc um and so he says look i think that because someone because a group can sometimes be a minority on the basis of language we should protect ethnical groups and they voted in everyone is like okay i don't know whatever this is we can just vote it up it's fine and so like while they have explicitly removed linguistic groups they then vote in ethnical groups who are essentially linguistic minorities with a different name attached to it right but the, the way that it gets voted in the way that the discussion just brushes it off and the way that essentially following that no in, like in implementing the genocide convention no one ever talks about what ethnical groups are it seems to just not matter that languages were smuggled back into the convention um but it's like that's the kind of mechanism which if taken seriously provides actually a like a potential legal in route for protecting language groups 
then in terms of like mood, what I've been focusing on, on political mood, I see it as being less effective because it's so implicit, right? No one looks at ethnical groups and and feels outraged because it's like it's an unusual term it's an uncommon term it's it's linked to language is not clear it's hard to to pin a mood on that word um but as a legal mechanism it's yeah possible that it provides an inroad all right now we're going to try to wrap up our q and a with this um this bunch of questions and I'll try to integrate them uh, in a in a coherent um, question. So, do you think the UNESCO decade of indigenous languages may end up with a stronger recognition, encouragement, and discussion of linguistic human rights at the Greater UN and its members? Uh, do we need to create a new declaration, perhaps, or is UNESCO too irrelevant to Greater UN policy making and to uh, to Carry on from that. Do you think language policy on a global scale would eventually get better before it's too late? I think that's the pressing question. Is it too late for yeah. uh, anything to be done? Yeah. So, uh, like, the short answer to "is it too late" is no. It it isn't. I don't think it is. And I'll get to yeah. I'll say more about that maybe at the end of my comments. But in terms of the United Nations Decade of Indigenous Languages and what it might achieve, like. I don't doubt that it will achieve something. It's like there's no way to say that it's a pointless exercise. Um, I think we, without measures to really protect the language rights defenders who are supposed to carry out the activities of the decade, like unless that is taken seriously, unless the threats to language rights defenders are taken seriously, um, then then it's very then what it can achieve is extremely limited, right? what it can achieve without protections for language rights practitioners is essentially to sort of increase the visibility of those languages without making any substantive change in the conditions that they um, experience. But the, if there are protections enabled for Indigenous language rights defenders that enable them to organise and mobilise publicly to affect state policies in the countries where they live, uh, then it's really possible that there could be substantive outcomes. Now, the challenge is though, in addition to just the vulnerability of those language rights defenders, is this concept of having a decade specifically for indigenous languages and who can participate in that. So one of the problems globally is that many states prevent people from identifying and mobilizing as indigenous. So China doesn't recognize any indigenous people. Um, India and Ind and yeah, India and Indonesia also don't and they the way that they do this all those all three of those countries say that everyone is indigenous right if everyone is indigenous then it doesn't matter no one is indigenous essentially right indigeneity has value as a specific legal and political status of of some people not of everyone if everyone is indigenous then it doesn't really matter why don't you just make it the international decade of people's languages um, and so what is also not discussed, as far as I can see, anywhere in the mechanisms for the international decade is, is how to secure the right for people to identify and mobilize on as Indigenous, right? And there's no discussion of that. So, like, in the United Nations um, documents discussing the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, which then led to the decade and so on, like China just says, like, this stuff is fine. This is about people who were colonized by Europeans. This has nothing to do with us. You all do whatever you want, right? And so for this, for the decade to be meaningful as a global event, there has to be a global discussion about who, who can claim the right to be Indigenous, who can mobilize on the basis of Indigenous identity. It's not about applying a worldwide filter that sorts the Indigenous from the non-Indigenous. It's really about creating the freedoms for people to identify as Indigenous and mobilize on that basis, right? So I think if those two things happen, if we can, if we can secure that right and if we can protect the people who want to mobilize in defense of that right, it's a powerful opportunity, right? A really powerful opportunity for substantial change to happen. Um, on a broader thing, nothing to do with the decade, uh, 
is it too late? No, it is not too late. It's absolutely not too late. So many languages spoken around the world today are in precarious situations, but they still have speakers. They still have a population. They still, you know, they have intergenerational transmission that might be declining, or they still have speakers who know the language and can transmit it to other people. Um, it's really only too late when all the languages in the world have no speakers, no records, etc. And then there's, then there's no opportunity, but there is so much, um, reason for hope right there is so much reason for hope in terms of the world's languages but the crucial thing to mobilizing to capitalizing on that hope is is the generation of that political mood which enables people to like not just act locally where they are to reclaim their languages and, and to do that massive important dangerous risky political work but to also mobilize in solidarity with one another right to recognize that what i do you do we do is all connected that really needs that political um mood to align everyone's actions and understandings of, of what's happening. All right. That was a great way to end our uh, discussion and our event for this morning. Once again, many thanks to you for engaging us and sharing your knowledge on these Thank relevant, you. pressing, and alarming, uh, quite frankly, issues affecting many cultural communities across the globe. So on behalf of us, the UP Department of Linguistics and the Katig Collective, we present this Certificate of Appreciation to you, Gerald Roach, for delivering a lecture entitled Why We Aren't Outraged by Language Oppression, a History, as part of the Linguistics Special Lecture Series organized by the UP Department of Linguistics and the Katig Collective. Given this 27th day of September 2022, signed by our chairperson, Maria Cristina S. Gallego. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was really great to talk with you all. Yes. And for those of you who tuned into our live streams, thank you as well. Stay tuned for more events and activities by our department in commemoration of our 100th year. Kindly answer the evaluation form in the comments section and to let us know how you have found our event today and to help us improve our future events. You will get your certificate of participation after answering the evaluation form. That is going to be open until 5 o'clock p.m. today. On Thursday, September 29, we have Dr. Maria Mercedes G. Planta, who will talk about Trinidad H. Pardo de Tavera, our department's first chairperson, and his 1892 work, Plantas Medicinales de Filipinas. So check out our social media accounts for details on that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye, everyone.